So thanks again for joining us. I'm Lisa Savage, and I'm here with John Gonzalez and Jonathan Carter and Don Neptune Adams. These are our three panelists. We're going to be hearing from uh, John Gonzalez first. He is a member of the impacted community um, on the Canadian end of these of the CMP corridor project. Um, John is a Taino uh, Pemichikamak. Did I say that right, John? Pemichikamak. That's good. Pemichikamak. Okay. Pemichikamak journalist, educator, and a documentary filmmaker. And he's written a book, Standing Rock is Everywhere, about his experiences there. He's a founder of the Standing Bear Network, which is part of uh, Standing Bear Native Indigenous, a media initiative covering indigenous issues, such as this one. And that rose out of uh, the Standing Rock occupation in North Dakota, but it covers environmental issues across Turtle Island. Uh, John's recent films include the devastating effects of the Genpeg hydroelectric dam. I just watched that short video this morning. It's very, very powerful. I uh, strongly urge you to find that on Facebook and watch it. And the upcoming full length documentary, Hydro Impacted. John is a water protector at the OCT Sequin camp, and he currently lives in Rhode Island. So welcome, John Gonzalez. <clears throat> well, thank you, Lisa, as always, for having me. Um, Ocheti Sequin camp is, a, is, is actually closed now, right, since the closing of the camps. Um, but, uh, you know, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so, yeah, my journey began at Standing Rock really and, uh, you know, since then, I've been going all across Turtle Island, uh, you know, advocating for Indigenous communities. Um, I like to begin, uh, uh, you know, my, um, my interviews with saying just Tansi Nina, Kanipu with Wampuske, Mikisu, Miguanapio, many blessings to all my relations in the four directions. Um, I am uh, an advocate for my people, uh, the Pemichikamek people uh, in Cross Lake, uh, Manitoba. And... Um, you know, we're living in precarious times right now, uh, you know, where green organizations are, uh, you know, touting false solutions. And the false solutions can be, you know, uh, more damaging than the obvious uh, oftentimes. I'm talking a bit about things like carbon offsets and, uh, of course, hydro. Um, hydro is not clean. It is not green. Uh, our people are dying. Uh, our moose, our sturgeon, uh, our wildlife cannot keep up with the fluctuation of these waters. Uh, people don't realize, uh, you know, exactly what happens. You know, here in the United States, you know, if we're if that electricity is coming down here from Can uh, from Canada, and you're flicking that light switch, you are, you know, really, uh, you know, contributing to the cultural genocide of Indigenous people. Uh, it's that bad. Some people believe that um, hydro has taken over where the um, Indian Act and uh, residential schools left off, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, cultural genocide that's going on right now. Uh, people are unaware of the uh, um, high amounts of methylmercury uh, in our waters, uh, which is a result of the uh, decomposition of, of organic material. Uh, it puts uh, very high, very high levels of uh, uh, methylmercury uh, into our food chain. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I got my phone set up on a tripod. <laughs> um, so, uh, and there are more devastating effects. People don't realize that, you know, uh, these reservoirs produce enormous amounts of CO2 and methane, uh, you know, which is also a result of the... Uh, the decomposition of organic material. So in some cases worse than, than that of coal. Um, I think you have some slides that you're gonna show uh, maybe in a little bit, but uh, a Harvard study from 2000, uh, 2016 uh, documents this toxicity. And uh, it also reports that uh, the Romaine Ford Dam will have high, some of the highest levels of uh, methylmercury poisoning. Um, yeah, so I thank you for having me here. I'm here to give uh, an indigenous perspective. Um, people don't realize, uh, you know, the impacts not only from 
uh, the uh, relocation of indigenous people. But, uh, you know, when you take away the food source, when you take away uh, the sturgeon uh, and, and the moose begin to disappear and, and the wildlife uh, begins to suffer from all that poisoning, our water is not drinkable, you know? And, uh, you know, these, um, these provincial crown corporations have made a lot of promises to indigenous people and they continue to make benefit agreements with indigenous people uh, that aren't to our benefit at all. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here and it's, uh, I'm honored to have advocates like you guys, you know, we're, we're working hard against the New England <coughs> uh, Clean Energy Connect, um, you know, which, uh, it, you know, is gonna cut a, uh, a New Jersey turnpike size corridor uh, through the pristine woods of Maine. And uh, of course that's Penobscot territory. I hope, uh, I hope Dawn Neptune Adams uh, is able to join us and she can talk uh, a little more about that. And then we also have here in New England, the um, Chippy, which is the, uh, uh, the Champlain Hudson River uh, Power Express, uh, they're calling it. And uh, it's all about these um, energy corridors. They wanna take this a, a pipe and, and drop it into the uh, under the bottom of the Champlain River and, and down the Hudson uh, to benefit the people of New York, the NECDC to benefit the people of uh, Boston. So Premier Legault has said um, that you know the intention is to turn Canada uh, into the battery of North America by way of these uh, you know devastating <coughs> uh, hydro infrastructure projects. Um, you know, in my community, Genpeg is just one of the first of many dams along uh, the Nelson River. Um, and uh, it controls the outflows of, of Lake Winnipeg. It's really, it's, it's the hub of all the uh, hydro generating stations along um, the Nelson River. And there are many going up right now. And we have a lot of concerns, particularly with Kiesk right now. And, uh, <clears throat> In the wake of, uh, you know, not only George Floyd, but just being in COVID-19, uh, our communities are very vulnerable right now when they have, uh, um, you know, shift changes with the, with you know, with, with these uh, work camps that they have, uh, and and it brings, uh, you know, bad things into our communities. You know, not just COVID-19, but uh, the rates of missing and murdered Indigenous women go up. And, uh, you know, we're talk talking about some of the already most impoverished uh, communities on Turtle Island. Um, you yeah, know, when I, when I talk about what's going on with hydro, I like to give a little bit of a, a snapshot of the community, you know, the portrait of the people uh, of that community that's, you know, that's being impacted. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a terrible thing, you know, particularly since we know that the residential schools uh, have had such an impact on our elderly, um, the last of which closed in uh, 1996. And uh, the reason why I'm bringing that up is uh, uh, I had a talk with one of the elders and, um, you know, he said to me, he said, you know, the, the thing that's impacting our people the most right now uh, is what happened uh, the, by way of the residential schools, you know, um, where they're still finding, um, you know, mass graves of missing and murdered, or, or, or you know, missing missing children uh, from the, uh, particularly now the Cinnaborn River, a mass grave was found. But I think it's important for people to understand a little bit of indigenous history. Uh, I can't get all into the Indian Act and 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 uh, and um, you know and, and our governments and, and whatnot, but we're struggling uh, right now as a people, and um, you know. We appreciate our, our allies. Uh, we appreciate the fact that indigenous voices um, you know, are being elevated. And, um, you know, our message is that um, we have to say no to, to Canadian hydro. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, I'm a little parched, but I, I hope I'm covering, uh, you know, things that are gonna benefit people. Mm. Thank you, John. It's a hot time to be doing this kind of work, certainly. 
Um, I'm sorry that we weren't able to show the photo slides that you uh, sent me. We're still working on that on the back end here, but something that you said really struck me, and that is that your people are feeling like the hydro took over where the Indian Act and the residential schools left off. And then, of course, the residential schools haven't really left off if the last one was closed in 1996 and people are still finding grave sites of children that were in those schools. Yeah, let me expound on that a little bit. Sure. Um, people might not be aware, uh, but we're, we're at a time and place right now where Canada and the United States has a truth and reconciliation obligation uh, to indigenous people, uh, particularly by way of the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, you know, which was adapted uh, you know, not that long ago, I think it was 2016 or so. Um, and it, it talks about the rights, you know, to self-determination. Um, it talks about, you know, really empowering indigenous communities. And, um, you know, what we have now are essentially new treaties that have, that have, that have risen up like the Northern Flood Agreement. And, and during these agreements, you know, the, um, the rep representative from Hydro held up a pencil and said, should the waters fluctuate above or below that of the height of a pencil, that the people would be compensated. Um, they promised to eradicate impoverishment uh, and provide jobs. And none of that has come to fruition. Um, and, and, it's, and it's amazing because just today, uh, Raymond Collins Robinson, a dear friend of mine in, in Cross Lake, um, had his prop on his motorboat destroyed because it, it hit some of the debris uh, that was in the lake. And um, of course, Manitoba Hydro has to pay for that. But the big thing is, is that our people are dying. You know, when that water fluctuates, when it freezes, then they drop the water level, people fall through in the skidoos. Um, it affects the migratory um, pattern of the animals. Um, it, it creates ha hazardous conditions even for the well-seasoned hunter, fisher, and trapper. Um, so it is, it is really, it's, it's torn apart the fabric of our communities and it's, it's created a lull of despair and, and, and increased the impoverishment. Um, you know, our, the people are in despair. I mean, there was, um, there was an incident just in 2016, six of our youth committed suicide like in a period of six weeks and that kind of lull of despair doesn't just disappear um, this is why I say Canada and the United States have a truth and reconciliation reconciliation obligation to indigenous people and um, you know we need to uh, we need to send a message you know to uh, um, you know Premier Legault and and uh, and Trudeau and Canada and the Crown and the United States um, you know, these, uh, these hydro projects are getting counted as green energy, you know, they're getting like subsidized and, uh, you know, they're benefiting from, from, uh, you know, whatever green monies or bonds or whatever is available out there, you know, they're benefiting from it under the guise of green and clean. And, um, you know, in the meantime, you know, our people are, are, are really, uh, really suffering. Uh, it's, it's some of the most heartbreaking conditions you can find. Uh, the homes are, are inadequate. They're filled with black mold. Uh, there's a lot of houses don't have siding. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's, of course, the instances of like um, uh, childhood asthma and diabetes and heart disease. Hydro is simply compounding what's already going on during a time when, when we should be really, um, you know, li living up to, to that uh, truth and reconciliation obligation. Thanks, John, for giving us that perspective about what goes on at the beginning of these projects. Um, you can see that we've got our slides working now. This is a, a, an important petition that John and his uh, group have been passing around to the governors of all the states that are considering this power to reject Canadian hydropower. I think that is a hyperlink on your screen if, if you're running a browser that will let you click on it. Uh, um, I learned a lot more about mega dams this year than I ever knew. 
Um, I knew why Maine didn't want it, but I did not realize how super destructive the type of hydropower that's uh, producing this energy is. It was, it's beyond anything that I as a, as a Mainer ever uh, would have guessed at or understood. So um, that's a good segue to our next presenter uh, because Don Neptune Adams is going to be speaking as a member of the impacted community here in Maine. Um, she's a member of the Penobscot Nation. She's not here to speak officially on their behalf, but I do know that they officially came out against this uh, CMP corridor project uh, this month. And um, uh, primarily Dawn is a journalist with the Sunlight um, Collective, Sunlight Media Collective, which does a lot of work to um, uh, elevate native voices and let us know what's going on in their environmental stewardship, which is so important. Uh, I've known Dawn for years as a grassroots activist. She also serves as a racial justice consultant to the Peace and Justice Center in Eastern Maine, uh, located in Bangor. When she's not battling polluters, plutocrats, and patriarchy, Dawn spends her time raising a teenager, which could possibly be harder than any of those three, depending on the teenager. But I think that her uh, child is a, a pretty awesome child. And, uh, but also building fine furniture. And she dreams of a day when we can all eat salmon from the Penobscot River and live together in peace. So welcome, Dawn. Thanks for being with us today. You'll need to unmute, Don. You're still muted. No matter how many times I do this Zoom thing, uh, I always mess it up somehow. Uh, hello, everyone. Quay Quay, Enza Louise, Don Neptune Adams, Mian Um, Hello, my name is Don Neptune Adams, and I am Penobscot. Uh, I live here in uh, Migiwigi, Bangor. I live in Bangor, which is right on the banks of the Penobscot River. This is my hometown. This is the town I have chosen uh, as my, my home. Um, and I am very, very happy to be here uh, as uh, a member of the Penobscot Nation, living next to the Penobscot River, Panawabski Wido. So I don't have any slides. Apparently, um, you're going to be looking at a picture of me <laughs> instead of my actual speaking. Uh, hi. There. Uh, I didn't um, give Lisa and her campaign any slides to, uh, to show you today. I'm just going to be speaking on my experience. Um, battling this CMP corridor that will go through uh, my territory if it is allowed to. So there are seven potential corridors uh, that will come down from uh, north of the imaginary line called the border. Uh, one of them is coming from uh, Hydro-Quebec. <clears throat> There are 933 total dams north of the imaginary line, and 30 of those are mega dams. Um, so this one from uh, Hydro-Quebec is, uh, has flooded the so-called Romaine River. And forgive me, I didn't get the time to find uh, the river's indigenous name today. And I hope the river will forgive me <laughs> for not knowing her true name. Uh, it comes, it's in Quebec province and it is one of the longest rivers in Quebec province. It's used by the Inu people uh, and stewarded by the Inu people who are trying to maintain their life ways, their ways of knowing, ways of being uh, in their ancestral territory. Recently, uh, the Penobscot Nation Chief Francis, Ambassador Dana, and many others were in contact with the Innu people and uh, assured them that we stand in solidarity with them. They also said that uh, our territory and their territory is just as important as everyone else's and that it should be protected. Um, supposedly, Hydro-Quebec and Manitoba Hydro have compensated the indigenous people for their, their the uh, ruination of their territory due to these floodings. Um, but as we can see, 
the people in these territories are still suffering and we stand in solidarity with them. Hi, John, good to see you. Uh, so when John and I went to the uh, Army Corps of Engineers um, public hearing, we were standing way in the back of the line, uh, you know, getting ready to speak. And the Army Corps of Engineers came back and pulled us up to the front of the line. This is the first time I have ever had this happen at any public hearing. Uh, I think it was John, because I don't pull that kind of star power, okay? Uh, but <laughs> uh, they came back there and, and pulled us to the front of the line, had us sign up and had us speak, uh, you know, not representing our people, but certainly there as representatives of uh, people who exist in their on their ancestral ter territory. They must have thought I was an elder. Um, I, I am well on my way to eldership, but not quite there yet. Uh, if anybody starts calling me grandma, I'm gonna be pissed. Just, just warning, you've been warned. Um, and certainly <laughs> John is, is not quite um, an elder yet either. Uh, I want to send out a, a shout out to John's uh, lovely wife who just had a birthday. Um, happy birthday, Joanna. And I do love your garden. <laughs> I also have a couple other shout outs um, to, to give. And uh, those shout outs are to Uncle Tommy and Auntie Rita, um, who have so graciously uh, come here to share uh, about what's going on with them and the damage that these dams have caused in their territories. Um, there were several others who came as part of a de delegation with a uh, North American mega dam of resistance. Now they came here and uh, held a press conference. They tried to get an audience with the governor uh, and the governor didn't show up. I think this shows how much she cares about the people of Maine and about indigenous people in general. Um, what can I say? I learned about the methylmercury poisoning uh, while they were here. And this is something that Penobscot people face in our territory as well. We can't eat the fish out of the Penobscot River. Uh, it's too full of mercury and dioxin from the paper mills uh, that, um, not just paper mills, but paper mills and industry that turned our river into a, a sewage line to the ocean. We understand this kind of poisoning. We understand being flooded. We understand government and industry in cooperation uh, to push through projects that we don't approve of. We understand government and industry uh, collaborating to find ways to not respect our sovereignty and stewardship. We also understand that industry uh, will use trickery. Now I'm, I'm being very polite here in using the word trickery. People at home know which word I would rather be using, but I'm gonna keep it, uh, I'm gonna keep it respectful here. So when John and I were at the Army Corps of Engineers, with Lisa Savage, Jill Stein, and uh, Tom, Senator Tom Saviello, um, and a whole big room full of people, people from Maine who were speaking uh, in opposition to this CMP corridor, this NECEC, so-called uh, you know, clean energy. Senator Tom Saviello came up to me and said, did the Penobscot nation, uh, give CMP permission to run this through Wabanaki egg. He didn't use the word Wabanaki egg, but you know what I mean. Um, so I said, no, let me text Kirk Francis. And I texted Kirk, did we give permission to CMP to run this line through our corridor? And he said, hell no. So what uh, the CMP did, the industry, what they did was, and they do this a lot, they will, send uh, an official request for information to one department uh, in a tribe and ask them a specific question. And then when that specific question is answered, they will use that as consent. 
So what CMP asked was, uh, does your tribe, and this was sent to the Cultural and Historical Preservation Department. The question was, uh, does your tribe have any historical sites or record of artifacts uh, in the line uh, where the CMP is gonna go? And our Cultural and Historical Preservation Department answered no. So this was taken as consent. And I'm really proud of our chief, our ambassador, our council, and our people for strongly coming out in opposition to this corridor. Uh, it can't be twisted anymore, not by industry. Um, so, let me gather my thoughts here for a second. I'm actually feeling a little uh, discombobulated being here, I'm, I'm moving out of this apartment. <laughs> I, I don't even have my makeup on. Brandon James was gonna come do my makeup and, and uh, I barely even have eyebrows. Um, so LD2094 will be voted on in the Judiciary Committee of the, the main state house tomorrow. We have other legislation coming up. Oh, thanks Heidi. We have other legislation coming up regarding CMP as well in November. Here in Wabanaki, now called Maine, we have a referendum vote. Uh, we see it sort of as a, a fourth branch of government, right? We have these, these checks and balances in place. And as much as I dislike following uh, the colonizer's way of, of governing, it's the system that it's in place right now, and it's what we have to work with. We fight them with everything we have, and it's usually still not enough. But I want to urge everybody to come out and vote in November against the CMP corridor. Our woods and our waters are some of the last and most pristine in, uh, in this place now called the United States. Um, we don't want to endanger any of it. And if you think about how the trees absorb carbon, and, and how they, uh, you know, work with us. Um, I'm getting a question about the, I don't know how it's worded yet. Sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's worded so that you have to answer no. The best source of information to go to is say no to NECEC -E um, on Facebook. There's a group and it is a bipartisan group. There are uh, Democrats, Republicans, Greens, um, independents, even libertarians, actually especially libertarians because they're anti-authoritarian. Um, so you can go to that group. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, you can go to that group and find all the information you need about that referendum. Uh, the two people I keep in touch with about this are Sandy Howard and Matt Wagner. I've actually been on panel discussions with Matt Wagner before about this very subject. Oh, the name of the group is Say No to NECEC -E and also search for Sandy Howard, S-A-N-D-I. Yes. Um, so getting back to that word trickery, um, as you know, Economic blackmail is part of the trickery. Uh, they will offer people who are socioeconomically oppressed uh, big amounts of money. Um, they will uh, try to convince you that it's in the interest of jobs. They will try to convince you that it's in the best interest of your electricity bill. Uh, the, the governor recently signed an agreement with Hydro Quebec to lower. Uh, supposedly lower um, our elect electricity bills. But what you don't realize is that it, they will raise prices in other places, um, and especially in places where people can barely afford their electricity bill as it is. Uh, I know that when um, North American Mega Dam Resistance came here, um, someone, who was it? Someone was saying that uh, they raised the prices of electricity 
in the most impacted areas, the places that are most impacted by the dams, which is not fair. Do not take this deal of a lowered electricity bill that will harm our relatives to the north. Uh, let me just check my notes here and see if there was anything else I, I always forget. So um, one thing is I want to emphasize that while a lot of the focus in that say no to any CEC group is on how this quarter will impact uh, the people of Wabanakiag, now called Maine, um, I'd like us all to remember that we need to stand in solidarity with the Innu people who will be impacted by uh, these mega dams and also with the Pimichikamak people. Um, my aunties and uncles and, and new relatives that I met while they came here to visit. Um, so we also want to encourage um, a new comprehensive environmental impact statement. Uh, that's the only way that things can be done fairly. Um, and of course, make sure that that environmental impact statement can uh, be, be done in a way that is impartial. Um, I also have notes here from the Land Use um, Commission hearing. Um, and uh, there were two dissenting votes. One was Jay Clemente, and the other one was, I believe, um, Bill Gilmore. Um, sorry for being so frazzled here. Um, the economic impact statement study is probably the, the most important thing, and that is what uh, the Penobscot Nation is pushing for currently. Um, I thank you all for listening, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. <clears throat> it's always very inspiring to hear the Native people, the Indigenous people, standing in solidarity with their uncles and, and aunties and cousins and brothers and sisters on both sides of the imaginary border, um, because yeah. indeed all life is connected and all of us uh, are impacted by decisions, even if uh, the European colonizers tend to compartmentalize things and just kind of focus right in on something small and forget what's happening elsewhere. That isn't really how our planet works, of course, and we're seeing mm -hmm. some real serious problems with that approach over the last several hundred years. So thank you for reminding us about that. Um, so I just want to, before we move on, from your presentation, I want to make sure that I am correct in thinking that tomorrow, LD2094, which is the uh, tribal sovereignty, the bill to reestablish tribal sovereignty to the the, the native the, rec, the tribes of Maine, is going to be heard, voted on. Yes. And Jackie had put in the chat while you were talking to uh, that the call is to be in Augusta at 8 a.m. if people want to stand with the Wabanaki people. Yes, this is an effort organized by our friends, allies, and accomplices. This is not something I had anything to do with. It's not something Sunlight Media Collective or the tribes had anything to do with. This is the people of Maine standing and saying that they respect Wabanaki sovereignty. Uh, they are showing the uh, Judiciary Committee as they walk into the State House uh, where they stand in respect to our sovereignty and stewardship. Now, the governor's office uh, has consistently um, fought to um, wiggle away out of respecting our sovereignty and stewardship. Our sovereignty is inherent. We're not asking them to give it to us because we already have it. What we want them to do is respect our sovereignty and we want laws in place um, that will uh, enforce that. Now, 16 months ago, there was a task force that was created to study ways in which Maine would have to respect federal Indian law with Wabanaki tribes. This is all we're asking for. We're asking for uh, federal Indian law to apply here as it does to the other 49 states. 
Um, and it is the governor who has disagreed with the task force on these 22 interconnected recommendations that are being sent to the legislature. It is expected to pass out of the Judiciary Committee into the legislature and be passed there as well. And the governor is expected to veto it. That's the lowdown on that. Um, Thanks for giving us the background on this important law. I have been following it and um, I wish you the very best success and I hope there are enough votes to override the governor's veto of her own task force's recommendations on this matter. So thank you. I need to also say that the, uh, the task force, that was a unanimous vote um, and it was constructed of the legislature, both the House and Senate, the tribal leaders, an ex officio uh, representative from the DEP and from the governor's office. So. Well, thank you so much for sharing that important information with us, Don. We're going to hear next from Jonathan Carter. Uh, Jonathan Carter is well known to many of you as the um, director of the Forest Ecology Network, which is a nonprofit forest advocacy organization currently focused on stopping the CMP corridor, but certainly not limited to that issue. Um, Jonathan has a bachelor's degree from Williams College and a master's in botany from the University of New Hampshire. He's taught at Umaine Farmington um, and done doctoral work in environmental studies and paleoecology. Um, he established Earth First in Maine and was a Green Party candidate for Congress and also for uh, the governorship in 1984, which established the Maine Green Independent Party as the first uh, Green Party officially uh, in the United States. Uh, Jonathan has run statewide referenda campaigns on forest practices. He's helped lead the efforts to stop bear baiting and many other campaigns dealing with uh, rapacious corporations such as Plum Creek, as Moosehead Development and Nestle Water Extraction. And he has worked on the uh, 2006 governor's gubernatorial campaign of Pat LaMarche, another supporter of our campaign. So I'm very happy to welcome Jonathan. He does not have any slides. He's going to talk to us and give us the lowdown on what he thinks we can do most effectively to stop this project. So welcome, Jonathan. You need to unmute, Jonathan. You're still muted. Am I okay now? Okay, Lisa, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you on this webinar. Um, I really appreciate all you're doing for the state of Maine by standing up to these rapacious corporate powers that you so recently referenced in regards to this CMP corridor. I'd like to start by reading the question that will be on the ballot in November, which will give people an opportunity to vote against this. But unfortunately, they're gonna to have to vote yes. The question will read, do you want to require the Maine Public Utilities Commission to reject a previously approved proposal to construct the New England Clean Energy Connect electrical power transmission line through Western Maine? And you do want to vote yes, so it's a little bit confusing. We don't want the project to come through, but we need to get it out to people that we need to vote yes, and they haven't assigned a number yet. So when they assign a number, it'll be vote yes on one or two or three or whatever it is, and that's very important. I coming at this from a scientific point of view as a forest expert and somebody who studied forests for decades, and my great concern about climate change the climate emergency that's here is very real. And every time I see the CMP and Quebec Hydro, these foreign corporations putting ads on television, telling people that they're producing clean green energy that they wanna pipe through Maine, give a little bit to Maine and then send most of it on to Massachusetts, I cringe because nothing could be further from the truth. This is a clear example of what you've said, Lisa, many times, this is about profit over the planet, profit over people. This is a bad idea and it's a bad idea for very many reasons. 
I was fortunate enough several years ago to be able to go up to Labrador and Quebec and view some of the horrific things that have been done up there. The flooding that's taken place, uh, the native, the indigenous tribes exposure to methyl mercury is a very serious problem. They flooded 13, they reversed the course of 13 rivers. They flooded rivers at different seasonal times that resulted in 10,000 caribou drowning. They had no respect for the land. And in terms of climate change, when they say this is green power, it's simply not true. It's simply a, a fraud. It's a lie. It's not true. The fact is that these huge reservoirs, aside from producing lots of methyl mercury that goes up the food chain and is actually making sick many indigenous people up there, these reservoirs are releasing huge amounts of methane, methane that is 30 times more impacting than carbon dioxide. In addition, they've destroyed huge thousands and thousands of square miles of boreal forest. And as we know, forests are the solution, or at least the way to mitigate the crisis of the climate emergency. It's the way that we can protect this um, planet by preserving our forests, protecting our forests, because they absorb carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide absorption in these areas, the areas that they have completely denuded and destroyed with their flooding is no longer no longer carrying out that task. So you're losing the sequestration potential of the area, and you're also maximizing this, the release of carbon dioxide, of methane, from the decomposition of the brush and detritus left behind after the flooding. This is not clean energy. It's not green energy. And anytime Hydro-Quebec says that, we've got to stand up and say, you're not telling the truth because it's not true. There have been several studies by MIT professors and others that have shown that this is not true. And we must recognize that this is not clean energy. And we, as Mainers, don't want to be complicit in bringing that dirty energy down to Massachusetts. I honestly call what they've done in Quebec and Labrador the Eastern Tar Sands Project. They've so destroyed the environment up there beyond recovery that it's on parallel with the tar sands, Alberta tar sands projects that have that have uh, we've all been very concerned about. Now, when this project, if it ever went forward, was to go through Maine, they're going to cut, as you know, through 53 miles of intact forest, and they're going to widen another widen another 92 miles of corridor. This will require to keep these corridors open the applications of herbicides, probably Roundup, which is like glycol-based chemical in Roundup, which is known carcinogen. It causes Parkinson's disease. There's a direct connection now, and they will spray that along these lines. They will also have to construct through these areas hundreds of miles of new roads, new roads that, new roads that potentially could be the basis for the next east-west highway that they've talked about. Um, it will destroy vernal pools. It will cross 263 wetlands. It will go across 115 streams. It will destroy deer wintering yards. It will negatively impact the scenic beauty all along the corridor with their 100, 100 to 150 foot towers. It will go under the Kennebec Gorge. They said they would go under it, but still that's no reprise from what they're doing to the rest of the state. It will cross the Appalachian Trail. It will cause scenic beauty to be very much degraded and reduce economic opportunities for outdoor recreation. The fire damage is tremendous. All we need to do is have a really serious drought and, the, and a storm comes through and that DC current can spark and cause fires in areas that we wouldn't be able to even touch and they just burn out of control. This is not a good project for Maine or for people in general or the world in general. If we want to get clean energy, we need to start not endorsing the corporate mega projects like these dams. We need to endorse local cooperatives that produce local energy for local people, and they have their control over it. This is about CMP making two to three billion dollars in profit. It's about Quebec Hydro making 12 billion dollars in profit, and it's not about the people of Maine at all. Several of the other panelists alluded to the fact that these, this was trickery. This is bribery. This is what they're doing. They're bribing, trying to bribe the people of Maine with their attitudes and their and their uh, their offers, which are minuscule compared to what they're going to profit from it. We need to stand up and we need to vote yes to the question 
that says, do you want to require the Maine Public Utilities Commission to reject a previously approved proposal to construct the New England Clean Energy Connect electrical power transmission line through Western Maine? You know, there, there's a Cree proverb that I often quote that goes something like this, only after the last tree has been cut down, only after the last river has been poisoned, only after the last fish has been caught, only then you will find that money cannot be eaten. And that's what this is about. This is why Lisa's campaign is so important from my point of view, because she is standing up for the forests, for the people. There's no difference between social justice and environmental justice. It's the same thing. And she's standing up for it. And I'm very proud to be able to participate. We need to get people out. Right now, we are winning this battle. In spite of the 17 to $20 million that Quebec Hydro and, um, and um, CMP have spent, we're still winning in the polls. They haven't been able to sway us. And now the tack they're taking, because it's rather ironic that there are two oil and gas companies that exist in Maine that are planning to spend a lot of money opposing this. And they're, they're fighting, saying, do you want our clean energy or do you want the oil and gas companies' uh, uh, dirty energy? They're, they're really distorting it. This is a very weird situation. It makes weird bedfellows. But we know in our hearts that it is wrong to allow this project to go forward. And if we allow it to go forward, it will just be more mega dams built in the future. Maine doesn't want to be complicit. And I hope that people will get active and on November 3rd vote yes to stop this absolutely horrendous project. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a rousing call to action. I, while you were talking, I realized that the slogan for this will be vote yes to reject because it does have the word reject. That's right. And that's what we're saying yes to. So that may be helpful as we wade through the legal verbiage to, uh, you know, communicate. It's with a people. little, it's a little confusing because you have to say yes to say no. You know. <laughs> I think saying vote yes to reject, people people can understand that they're voting yes to reject. Yes, um, they can. Yeah, thank you so much. One of the things that came up for me while I was listening to you too is that when I've heard the um, uh, mega dam resistance speakers come traveled, I heard them at UMaine Farmington last fall, one of the things that the impacted communities talked about was the smell. Because just imagine flooding a large area of vegetation with about 14 inches of water and then just letting it sit there for a while. Um, that is the way that it smells when they make these uh, reservoirs to, to feed the mega dams. So it's too bad that Rotten we can't eggs. bring you that smell right now. Um, but uh, <clears throat> you can imagine it, I think. Um, I'm very, I was also very interested to hear Don refer to referenda, which we use in Maine quite a bit. As we know, we got ranked choice voting uh, as a referenda item twice, maybe three times if you count the referendum for the presidential election um, being affirmed. But of course, you can, that doesn't pass a law, then the legislature must act on the will of the people. And, um, but I had never actually thought of it as, an, as a fourth you know, check and balance in the, um, you know, the checks and balance. And when, once corporate money owns all your branches of government, you're in big trouble. And that fourth branch of the people's voice in the form of a referendum is becomes increasingly important. So can I, can I, Lisa, can I just say one thing? Sure thing. Yeah, th th this, this is, this referendum was put on the ballot by people who went out in the middle of January to collect signatures. They worked really hard. They were passionate. They really deserve a, a great uh, deal of credit for their perseverance and, and, and going forward. But what does CMP do? They hire the slickest lawyers they can at $400 an hour from Pierce Atwood down in Portland. And they go after every signal signature on that thing. And they got close. They got close. They disqualified a lot of them. But they, they got close to actually turning this thing around. And, and uh, thankfully... It will be on the ballot. There is some question about the constitutionality of the question uh, because of the fact that it's a uh, it's a a, um, a it's an approval of a proposal uh, of, an, of a proposal by the Public Utilities Commission, which is not a legislative body. So there may be problems. They'll have their lawyers on this. Even when we pass this yes on this question, they will have their lawyers going after us. 
So we're, we're, we're not out of the woods by a long shot. Um, they are going to throw out everything. That, as I said, they've already spent $20 million and, uh, and, and counting. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, the other thing they've been throwing money at is their advertising agency, because I saw where some Maine legislators, including some past Maine legislators, definitely a, a group from um, various parties, sent a letter to Hydro-Quebec, and I believe also to the premier, like the, um, you know, the equivalent of the governor of the province of Quebec, and they said, quit trying to interfere with the outcome of a Maine election. We don't need foreign interference in our election, let the people of Maine, you know, decide and vote because of course we've all seen the flood of advertising making these false claims about the project. So there, uh, the, you know, the, the profiteers are going to fight us on many fronts and uh, luckily the people united um, cannot ultimately be defeated. I do believe that and, and um, I know that uh, Jackie Devineau said she was, says in the chat she was one of the uh, people that help collect those signatures in the dead of winter. And I would guess that many of the people uh, watching this webinar participated in that. I certainly saw people standing out in the bitter cold in Farmington collecting signatures. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's sometimes how, what it takes. Well, we're going to transition a little bit and then go into our Q&A um, uh, part of the webinar. And what we're going to do is ask uh, the people uh, watching our webinar if they would like to participate in a poll very similar to one that the Bangor Daily News recently ran, where they asked people, do you want CMPs, do you support CMPs proposed transmission corridor through Western Maine? It's a yes or no answer. You don't have to participate if you don't want. And panelists, we cannot participate, but the audience can. And we'll, so we're gonna give uh, them a minute to make their selection. And then we're going to show them the results of how they uh, voted on this survey. And we're also going to show you the outcome of the Bangor Daily News poll, which uh, I can't okay. hear you, Lisa. Oh, there you go. Well, some, can someone explain what Bill Janet Mills vetoed? We are anticipating that uh, predicting that Janet Mills will veto the um, LD 2094, which is the bill for tribal sovereignty. I think that was the reference to um, a, a, a veto from the governor. Can you hear me okay now? All right. So we're about to see the result of your survey and we will also, maybe we'll see the Bangor Daily, oh, Okay, 100% of the people watching this webinar are ready <laughs> to vote yes on the referendum. And here's how the Bangor Daily News survey. Now, the Bangor Daily News has a fairly conservative readership, and I'm often surprised at the way their uh, polls come out. So I was um, surprised to see that. I think we're going to see the slide in a minute. But basically, more than 90% of the people who responded to the Bangor Daily News poll which had those, that exact wording, uh, more than 90% uh, voted no. Yes, they were down in the single digits for yes. That is indicative that indeed this issue crosses conservative, radical, liberal, uh, independent, green, Republican, Democrat. This is an unpopular project with all those groups in Maine. So um, that's encouraging. Okay, we are ready for some questions that have been put into the Q&A and I'm waiting for Chris to show me the questions that I am going to be asking. Um, is there an ad campaign against the corridor? Where is it? How exactly can someone contribute money to support it. I'm going to call on you first, Jonathan, and then other panelists want to weigh in after. Is there an ad campaign against the corridor? Yeah, yeah well, that's the paradox that it, paradox here. There, there, there is a couple of gas companies uh, from Texas, they're Texas-based, something called Calpine and Vistra, Vistra, that have natural gas electricity generation plants in the state of Maine. And um, they realize that 
if power comes from Quebec Hydro, their power is going to be too expensive and they're going to end up losing their profit from these gas generators. So they've actually stepped into this battle. So it's a gas and oil companies duking it out with CMP and Quebec Hydro with the big money, with the big money. They have big money and there will be opposition. Earlier in the year, they had some very good ads up, but it's a, it's a, it's a very strange makeup of bedfellows. You mentioned all these people that are involved, Greens, Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents, libertarians. It's, it's, it's a very unusual group of people. Uh, but they're all united against it. Um, the, the Stop the Corridor group is also trying to raise money to do ad, ads. And, uh, and hopefully they will be able to raise some money. Hopefully we'll be able to all send them something to make sure that they have some resources to put our message out. Um, but having been involved with a lot of very expensive campaigns, both referenda and uh, political campaigns, um, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really tough for grassroots people to raise the big bucks that are necessary. And that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem with democracy. It goes right to the core of it. We don't live in democracy when the big money corporations like CMP and Hydro-Quebec, both foreign corporations, can come in and spend gobs of money to influence voters. There's, there's really a fundamental flaw if this ever occurs again. We ought to pass laws to stop it. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Don, did you uh, have something to say on this? Yeah, I, I actually um, disagree with Jonathan. I don't think we've ever lived under a democracy that was beneficial for all the people. We have lived under a democracy that was beneficial for the rich, um, for uh, you know the powerful, but not for everyone. I don't think there is any such thing as democracy in this place that is now called the, the United States. Um, so going back to Strange Bedfellows, um, I was on a, a discussion um, on WERU uh, just after the um, Army Corps of Engineers public hearing and the um, Public Land Use uh, Commission's uh, vote. Um, and I was agreeing with Senator Tom Saviello uh, about things that he was saying and thinking that I have never, almost never in my life agreed with Republicans, but this really is um, an effort by the people of Maine, no matter um, what political background they have. Um, I'm just sorry, as the messages come up, I, I read them, but um, <clears throat> anyway, um, we were talking about grassroots not having the same money to fight this as uh, industry does. I have been getting mailers from industry over and over and over again, telling me um, how this is gonna be great for jobs and uh, great for the people of Maine and how it's gonna benefit us. All of those have been um, you know, refuted, those claims. They have money to buy full page ads in our newspapers. We are being bombarded with propaganda from uh, the CMP. And the CMP is universally, um, well, they're not well liked here and they're not well trusted. They, they rank even less trusted than the, uh, the electric company out in California who started those fires. Um, we don't have the money uh, to fight back in the ways that they're fighting. We don't have a legion of army, uh, uh, um, an army of lobbyists and lawyers uh, like they do with Pierce Atwood. Um, but what we have is we have solidarity with one another. We have a commitment to stand with one another against industry. And we have people power as was um, you know, shown by the gathering of signatures. Um, even in the face of, of oppression, you know, they're, um, they were the people gathering signatures and the activists who are involved in this battle, uh, they've been targeted by the, the police. They've been targeted by industry. 
Um, all of this information can be found again on that group page, uh, say no to any CEC. Thank you, Dawn. Um, I'm just gonna uh, put in a little anecdote here and I think John Gonzalez wants to speak to this question too. I, as many of you know, I just retired from teaching school for 25 years in central Maine and I was a reading interventionist most recently and I was sitting with some fairly young children. Uh, we were going to watch a video about some um, uh, grammar or reading or phonics topic. I don't remember what, but you know, if you watch a YouTube video, you often, a commercial comes on before and that ubiquitous uh, Hydro-Quebec ad came on and all three of the kids went, oh, I hate that ad, I'm so sick of it. And this is back when we still were having in-person school. So that was months ago. You can only imagine how sick of it they are by now. Many times this kind of glut of advertising has the opposite effect on people. John, did you want to speak to this? Um, I was just going to say that, um, you know, for people who want to get involved, there's a number of ways to do it. Um, you know, one organization, NAMRA, is, uh, you know, they're doing a wonderful job uh, bringing people together. That's the... Uh, uh, North American uh, Mega Dam Resi Resistance Alliance, and uh, we're circulating a petition right now. Um, I'll try to I'll, I'll put it in the feed, I guess, uh, and also on Facebook. And um, and there's there's also um, Waniska time is um, a group of uh, hydro in impacted communities, and they work closely with the University of Manitoba. Um, so. There's a lot of good people that are coming together, working on these uh, uh, these solutions. Um, you know, these dams can be decommissioned. Uh, they have been decommissioned. Many of them are, are getting old, and they have to be put to bed. Um, and uh, and what happens? But the fish come back, the wildlife comes back, and Mother Earth uh, does heal herself. So. You know, there are calls to action, you know, support, uh, support indigenous journalism. You know, Dawn uh, Neptune is, uh, you know, a wonderful journalist. And uh, I forget, is it Sunrise? Sunlight oh. Media Collective. Sunlight Media Collective, right. Um, I'm Standing Bear Network. We need to learn to tell our own stories through indigenous eyes. And that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why I appreciate Lisa this uh, platform that you've given us, um, you know, because I think it's important for us to get the uh, Indigenous perspective out there. So Indeed, very important. Here's a question from the audience. Do electricity consumers need to reduce our demand for electricity in order to discourage building of dams, corridors, and fuel burning power plants? Some will be willing, but others will just use more. Corporations will not use restraint. I was happy to say something. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the realities of the world today as we face the climate emergency is that we need to learn that less is actually more. That we need to learn that in order to make the planet safe and to make the planet survive the onslaught of climate change, which is gonna hit no matter what, no matter what we're gonna face it, face that problem. We need to very much consider that less is more, that we should try to consume less. We should be more cognizant of waste and we should look at local development of sustainable power like they're doing in Madison, like they're doing in Farmington that will allow us to produce our power that's needed locally and not in the hands of these mega corporations that are simply out there to exploit our pocketbooks and to make as much money as they possibly can. Access to power should be a human right, just like healthcare. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I know there's also a bill before the legislature, I don't know if it'll come up this session to uh, make CMP a consumer owned utility also. That's a, another interesting angle. And Seth Ferry's bill, I think. That varies, Bill, indeed. Um, John, yeah. you've unmuted. Did you want to speak to this? Should we reduce our consumption also? 
Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I wasn't meaning to specifically address this, but uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a big thing. Um, you know, right now, you know, with Trump in the presidency, you know, he's, uh, you know, his big thing was energy dominance. And what he's done is he's gone around, you know, fracking all over the, all over the United States, uh, the Bakken shale and the Marcellus shale. And, um, uh, you know, it's kind of in, in a way, I mean, as we've already spoken that, you know, methane is the primary component of natural gas and it's many, many times uh, the greenhouse gas and CO2. Um, it's kind of thwarted uh, what, what Canada has been trying to do in terms of becoming the battery of North America. Um, you know, we have power plants that are, you know, peaker plants that, that aren't even used to their fullest capacity. Um, you know, we just, you know, we stopped a billion dollar frac, uh, frac gas power, power plant uh, from being built. Um, we need to do everything I can, that we can in terms of um, energy conservation. And we have to be careful with the utilization of the wind and solar, but it's there. We can do it responsibly, you know, but there is mining uh, things that are uh, concerns that are involved there. Um, and, uh, you know, how those, how those things are decommissioned after they lived, you know, their usefulness. Um, so, I don't know. I hope I uh, contributed to that. Thank you. You did. Don, did you want to weigh in on this one? Yes, I would. Um, so, yes, we all need to reduce uh, our use of electricity, um, especially when it comes from, um, you know, industry that is, is very much not beneficial for us. But I'd also like to state that um, it is a tactic by the people in power who will place it all on us, place the blame all on us uh, and say, well, you know, if, if you weren't using so much electricity, we wouldn't need to back these big multinational corporations to bring electricity here. Uh, they'll say, well, you know, if you weren't using the straws, uh, that you get at fast food restaurants, we wouldn't have so much plastic pollution. Um, what they fail to mention though, is how much of this energy is used by industry. If somebody will pull up the Bangor Daily News article about uh, Governor Mills um, making a deal for uh, cheaper electricity in the state of Maine, um, there is someone there who is telling us that this kind of energy deal will not benefit the people of Maine. It's more to benefit paper mills and industry. Um, so this is the way they twist things and, and uh, have us blaming ourselves for things that are actually if all of us stopped using electricity, do you think that industry would, would still not need multinational corporations to bring it here? Okay, I'd like to capitalize uh, on what Dawn just said. Uh, and that's exactly what's happening is like, uh, with respect to the Kiesk and uh, other uh, generating stations, as much as 20% of their load is used to, is used for, uh, the pipelines, you know, for the, for the frac gas pipelines, the oil, um, the compression stations. So uh, that has nothing to do, you know, really with, um, uh, you know, how many windmills we put up. We have to stop, uh, you know, the extraction of these fossil fuels. We got to keep it in the ground and realize that, you know, when you start to realize that they're using it to power the fossil fuel industry, you realize just, you know, how not green hydropower really is. So we got to get some of our rocket scientists out there uh, in a lot of these climate organizations. We got to get hydro out of the Green New Deal um, and, and really um, turn, you know, change the paradigm, change the paradigm so people realize that, that hydro is not clean and green. You've helped us understand that quite a bit better, I think, than many of us do. Um, 
no discussion of climate change would be complete without me getting on my main natural guard soapbox and saying the Pentagon is driving climate change. The Pentagon is the biggest institutional consumer of fossil fuels. It fights war to control petroleum, burning lots of petroleum so it can fight wars to, and so on. Um, you know, whenever people say, oh, we need to make sacrifices. Well, okay, so I'm sitting in a hot room and I'm not using an air conditioner and, you know, I'm trying, we are all trying to do our parts, but, you know, the Pentagon flying those military jets and dropping a bomb, you know, every few minutes on another country that we can't see and our media doesn't want us to see, that is a big climate change driver. And um, I just, I can't let the opportunity pass to connect those dots. Um, we have another question here from my friend Bruce Gagnon. Why would anyone vote for politicians that are raising money from corporate executives and such? They are compromised before they even hold the election. <laughs> Jonathan, you've run for office. Did you accept donations from corporate lobbyists, corporate executives, or the super PACs? Well, I got, I, corporate money? Lisa, I got rich on it. What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> I wouldn't accept any corporate money ever. OK, I mean, it, 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 it really does taint people. And if uh, if um, Sarah Gideon and, and uh, Susan Collins are trying to say that they're not influenced by the millions of dollars that have been given to them by their corporate supporters. Why haven't they stood up and talked about the crisis of climate change and what we need to do? Why haven't they stood up and talked about the laws that uh, allow the military to, you know, as you were pointing out, burn millions and billions of gallons of fuel that is contaminating the air. Why haven't they stood up for the forest? Because the forest offer us the best solution to getting the climate crisis mitigated. We are in it for good now. We are gonna experience very hard times in the years ahead, but we can mitigate the extremes and at least keep the planet habitable if we had a policy that went after protecting forests. And this whole project in, in, in Quebec and the project bringing the power down is destroying forests. We should have a complete moratorium on forest destruction and require all silviculture to be silviculture that enhances the forest capability to sequester carbon. But that's on another point. The money in politics has been there forever. It's a problem. We ought to have laws that prevent it. And um, it's, 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 why, it's why we have what we have. We have people that are just the servants of the big special interest in corporate money. In Does that sound pessimistic enough? Thanks. You take well, corporate money, Lisa? Do I take corporate money? No, I don't. In fact, I've already turned down uh, an offer to take corporate money. Good. Empty. I knew you didn't. And I said to the team, but the, wouldn't that be taking corporate money? And they were like, yep, so we can't do that then. Um, I think it's- I would also course. like to speak to this, Lisa. Sure, go ahead. Um, so in regards to um, people not taking corporate money when they're running for office, I have a slight announcement to make. Uh, yesterday, I officially became um, a vice presidential candidate on the Dario Hunter 2020 ticket. He is now my running mate and we don't take corporate money. We never will. We are for the people, we are for the planet, we are for peace. Great, Wonderful. thanks for letting us know that. Um, it's probably time to give each of the panelists a chance to make a brief closing statement. Um, we're about eight minutes from our uh, end time. And um, so uh, John, would you like to go ahead and then we'll hear from John and then Jonathan Carter. Sure. Uh, we stand in solidarity with our relatives to the North, the Cree, the Innu, the Pemiquicamac people. We stand in solidarity and we know how it feels to be poisoned. We know how it feels to be flooded. Uh, we know how it feels to have our uh, ways of being and ways of knowing um, interrupted by industry multinational corporations even. Uh, we stand in solidarity with the people of the state now called Maine. We do not want a corridor running through 
our territory. Um, I'm going to keep working on this as much as I possibly can and looking forward to collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. John Gonzalez, would you like to make a closing statement? Sure. Um, you know, all, all I can think of right now in this political moment is that the greatness of a nation can be measured by how we treat our most vulnerable people. And, uh, you know, that would be our, what we're talking about is an environmental justice issue. And, um, you know, people are suffering right now. Uh, you know, if climate change weren't a part of anybody's vocabulary, there would still be indigenous people suffering in so many ways uh, by way of assimilation and, and uh, you know, the policies that, that have come into effect by way of the doctrine of discovery. It's, it's just, a, it's a hard thing. And there are a lot of layers of trauma uh, in the indigenous communities. That's why I think that this forum right here is so important. I think that people need to come together in a good way um, and, uh, you know, understand, uh, you know, that we are all connected, you know, uh, by way of the water, you know, it's that, that mini Wachoni that we talk about is that sacred life giving water, which mother earth provides liberally to all without discrimination. So in that way, maybe it can help people to understand how we're all connected. Um, and uh, I think I want to thank uh, Namra and Manis Katan, and uh, I want to thank Dawn and Jonathan and, and you, Lisa, um, and uh, you know everybody who's coming together in a good way to understand that you know we really have to stop these colonial projects. Uh, you know, hydro is devastating our indigenous communities at a time where we're so technologically advanced. We're, we're ready, you know, for green uh, for green energy. Uh, you know, solar uh, and, uh, you know, geothermal and, uh, and wind. So, um, yeah, so many blessings, you guys, and thank you for letting me share this space with you tonight. Thanks for being with us, John. It was a pleasure to hear from you. Uh, Jonathan Carter. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa, for inviting me to participate in this panel. I've, I've really enjoyed it. You know, we're dealing with a, a heck of a time right now with the COVID pandemic. And to focus in on this Hydro-Quebec and CMP corridor is, is very difficult. But th this project is just a microcosm of a bigger problem. And that's the fact that we have on this planet a type of vulture capitalism that is only interested in profits, not in people, not in planet. And you've so elegantly stated that you are for people planet and that the profit shouldn't be the primary goal. I really hope that people will get out and talk to other people and actually encourage them to go vote in November, not only for you, Lisa, but to vote yes for stopping this project, this CMP quarter. I always like to quote Rachel Carson because she's one of my, I'm, 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 I admire her very, very much. She really changed my life. And she once wrote that humankind is challenged that it has never been challenged before to prove its maturity and its mastery, not of nature, but of itself. And I think that's what we need to do. That's what we represent. That's why we're fighting this project because we've got to tame the, de the demon in us that is destroying the planet. And I thank you for having us here and I wish you the best of luck. And I'll, I certainly think that as we move forward, you're gonna get gather steam and momentum and we're gonna put you in the US Senate so you can bring these values right there so that we can have them front and center. And I know you won't waver one bit. So thank you very much. And I hope people will get on board with your campaign and follow you and do whatever they can to get their friends out there to vote for you. And remember that ranked choice voting gives you a real opportunity. So thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and I'll just make a little plea here at the end. Since we don't take corporate money, we depend on the donations from grassroots uh, you know, organizers and activists like you to um, print our signs, uh, run our webinars, 
And we have a very, very dedicated group of volunteers. A lot of talented volunteers have joined in from really all over the country because our, pop our uh, senator, current senator is so unpopular. But um, we do welcome your donations. And I think that uh, Chris Kerr is going to put, yep, he's put a, a link to our website. You can donate there. Or, or if you prefer to send a check or um, money, you, there's a, a mailing address, the U.S. Post Office, of course, we want to support them too. But uh, we promise to use any donations that we receive to fight our hardest under this ranked choice voting system to uh, get these corporate lackeys out of government and bring a voice for the people. We do have a real actual chance to elect the first green to the U.S. Senate. And it's a team effort. I'm the spokesperson. There's a whole big team here working on it. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you panelists for bringing your heart and your truth and your wisdom to us and sharing it with us. I wanna thank the people on the team, on my team that have made this possible. Chris Kerr, our wonderful campaign manager keeps us all uh, moving in the same direction. And, Kelly Merrill is the one that makes all the moving pieces come together so that we have a webinar and Dave Schwab um, also uh, live streams this. We have been getting a lot of live stream views and then as soon as the Facebook live stream is over, uh, that becomes a recording on Facebook. And then it, within a couple days, we'll get the recording up onto our YouTube channel for the campaign also because that's a little more shareable. Some people don't like to go on Facebook. So thank you so much. This has been a great discussion. Appreciate it. And I hike. You will, everybody.